because the closer you look at the numbers, the quicker they vanish. And you realize, quite obviously, that a new term has been fobbed off on Africa to define and explain what really is the deepening spiral of poverty, unemployment, civil disturbances, uh, diseases connected with malnutrition, tuberculosis, and so forth. It's a, it's a wonderfully easy and very glib kind of theory. At its heart, at its core, it assumes that if Africans will change their sexual behavior, if Africans will wear condoms, if Africans, males, will be circumcised, this will be the answer to AIDS, or the provision of extremely dubious and often very toxic drugs, as if there's going to be a pill for every ill in Africa. It's a shortcut way of avoiding the hard, grinding realities about what is really making people sick in Africa. And if you ask me, are people sicker today than they were 30 years ago? I'm going to answer you based on my travels in Somalia, Ethiopia, Kenya, Senegal, and South Africa. There's no doubt in my mind that people are sicker in Africa. They are living shorter lifespans. Is it because of their sexual behavior? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That is one of the poorest, weakest, feeblest sides to this whole AIDS in Africa epidemic. This, this, uh, racializing and sexualizing and infantilizing of African daily life. The claims often made by AIDS researchers about African sexuality take us back to the 19th century. They take us back to the Victorians. They take us back to old National Geographics from 70 years ago with the strange sexual customs of the natives kind of thinking. So I think you would find that much of what is claimed about AIDS in Africa is not only based on, weak, based on weak statistics, dubious numbers, it's also based on a kind of racist, arrogant set of assumptions that really were popular a hundred years ago, but now have been brought back into vogue by AIDS researchers. And so uh, the, the, the long and the short of it is that it is time for people to ask hard questions, have second thoughts. It's not too late for us to change or correct what has been one of the great medical hoaxes or medical fallacies of the 20th century, now into the, into the 21st century for that matter. An another aspect that needs to be looked at very closely when discussing uh, AIDS in Africa is the need to separate the term HIV, which is a molecular biological term th that many people criticize in the first place in terms of how accurate these tests really are for HIV antibodies, separate HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, from what is called AIDS, which is acquired immune deficiency syndrome. The first is a, an alleged blood specific test the second is a collection of symptoms. Often, however, the two are run together and they simply become HIV AIDS. So the next step, for example, in having a clear, better understanding of what is afflicting Africans is to separate the HIV tests from an actual AIDS diagnosis. In that case, you will notice that the place where these HIV tests, so-called, carried out in Africa is almost exclusively in antenatal clinics, clinics for pregnant women. And the medical literature has established long ago that pregnancy or a previous pregnancy is in fact a confounding factor that will cause a false positive test result. So if you were looking for a cohort of a population from which if you tested, you would get high numbers of HIV positives. You could not do better than to go to an antenatal clinic to go and only test pregnant women. But it's based on those tests that then 
extrapolations are made to the alleged HIV rate found in the entire population. I, I'm suggesting that this is a, a, a kind of a confusion uh, in terms of testing procedures that would lead me to flunk anyone that's, that took Statistics 101 and made that kind of gigantic leap in logic. If you ask people about the flaws in the HIV test, they will claim, in the absence of solid, you know, solid scientific knowledge, that these tests are accurate. The fact remains that those tests have been shown to be extremely inaccurate when the person being tested, uh, for example, has tuberculosis, has malaria, is pregnant, suffers from a wide range of other kinds of opportunistic infections. Africa is a perfect place in which to run these tests and be guaranteed high numbers, if you will. And so the focus has been on these HIV rates or these HIV numbers, and the next step is to provide medicine to treat this alleged condition that one finds widespread in some communities in Africa. So instead of focusing on, let's say, the four symptoms that define an AIDS case, let us say a patient has diarrhea. A doctor should treat the diarrhea, treat it, for example, with rehydration tablets. If a person has a, a persistent cough or high fever, treat the cough or treat the high fever. But given the, um, uh, the fascination and the hysteria about HIV and AIDS in Africa, the first thing that people want to do is to feed drugs to those people allegedly to combat their HIV status, not the clinical symptoms that define an AIDS case. It's another way of saying that in order to get a grip on HIV and AIDS in Africa, the two terms need to be separated and deal with one, deal with the other. But if you wonder why there is so little attention being paid to the persistent diseases of poverty and malnutrition and other diseases in Africa, it's because AIDS is what now defines the African continent. It's been that way for the past 20 years. I go to international conferences on African studies that are, say, about uh, health issues in Africa. There is not one word about tuberculosis, nothing about leprosy, nothing about tetanus, measles, malnutrition, uh, river blindness, but AIDS is everywhere.